Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. If you go to a lot of gaming conferences, a GDC sort of casual connector, uh, People will sort of tell you that uh, analytics is just as important as game design, these things. You have to measure everything and uh, the rich get better and everything. You, you need to monitor all the analytics side of things. But um, that can be sometimes very hard if you have sort of, uh, don't have a lot of track record, a lot of sort of data. In fact, there's a famous quote by Charles Babbage, one of the, the founders of the computer. He said, of, um, um, errors made from inadequate data are better than having sort of uh, estimation from no data at all. So uh, to talk about what it's like to sort of do analytics and sort of indie game developers, please join me in welcoming Patrick. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Hi, everybody. Nice, intimate audience here, and thanks for coming. And uh, hopefully, we have some interesting data to share with you today in a few of these slides. Um, just briefly about the agenda. So we're going to give a little bit of a background on our company. Just by show of hands, how many people are familiar with Priori data up front? A few. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of the app stores. Uh, we call the state of the app union. We'll talk a little bit about some Google Play information, a little bit about Apple App Store information. Um, kind of talking about the traditional narratives that we hear about successes and failures in the stores and how that might be relevant or relatable to you. Uh, then we'll try to make it really actually personal and applicable to you by talking about what it looks like for a new game developer, uh, indie, what are their chances of success in the stores today. Uh, and then we're going to give some concrete examples about how you might be able to improve your outcomes with your games by benchmarking and setting better expectations. And then we can wrap up with some Q&A. So just to kick off uh, in terms of us, we are an app store intelligence provider. We analyze app stores. We're based in Berlin, Germany. We were founded two years ago and have 18 people working at the company right now. Um, we operate in the same space as Appiani Sensor Tower. We're doing competitive benchmarking analytics and market data. So we're not actually trying to help developers better understand the performance of their own apps. We're rather trying to analyze the stores and give developers an understanding of how they compete and how they perform relative to others in the space. Our product, we call it Priori Data Pro. It's a software as a service platform that allows you to quantify, benchmark, and track the performance of any individual app across the Apple App Store and Google Play. 55 countries, uh, we pull in a lot of information, both from the app stores directly and from publisher partners uh, that we work with, which I'll explain a little bit more about afterwards. Essentially, our product is we can provide a download and a revenue estimate for every app, which you can then benchmark against your own performance. And just me. We're based in Berlin, but I hail from the U.S. originally. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast and was a, have been a longtime gamer throughout my, uh, throughout my youth, and I try to continue it now, although I'm a, a father of a young child, so I, I don't have as much time anymore to, to dedicate to it and to fit into it. Before moving into, into this business, I was actually an investor. I was uh, working in uh, investment banking at Morgan Stanley and then at a private equity firm, actually investing in information services businesses. I really got the understanding of how powerful data can be for making better decisions. And I wanted to apply that type of framework to a new industry, a new economy uh, that everyone recognizes as transformational and extremely profitable for a lot of people, but still for many is intransparent. So state of the app union, and here I'm just going to start very, very high level before we dive down, um, just to kind of highlight the narrative that we see. Imagine where we came from in 2008, uh, 800 applications in the stores, 10 million downloads initially in the first weekend. Yes, it was a success from the get-go, but I don't think anyone could necessarily foresee how transformational it was actually going to be. Here we are, this was from Apple's uh, New Year's Day press release of this year. Developer community has raked in 25 billion. App Store offers 1.4 million apps. iOS ecosystem, and we're just focused, we're gonna skip back and forth between iOS and Google here just so we don't get too data heavy. Um, but Apple claims iOS ecosystem has helped create over 600,000 jobs. 
this has really become a global economy. Um, three million apps, again, across iOS and Google Play, about seven billion monthly downloads globally, which is what we're tracking across the two stores, 1.75 billion in revenue processed through the stores, through paid downloads and in-app purchase, um, plus on top of that, all the advertising revenue, plus on top of that, all the other mobile revenue, which is funneled through the phone, but not necessarily the store, like an e-commerce uh, purchase, for example. It's a massive economy. And we hear this narrative that the App Store is a success for everybody. It's given rise, obviously, to, in the gaming space, new dynasties, some, sometimes old dynasties who have really profited from the move to mobile. And you would think maybe that life is pretty great for all participants, right, in the gaming space. It's great for about 300, is what our data tells us. And out of 475,000 developers who are active right now in the stores, 300 is not a great percentage. It's 0.1%. We'll, we'll go through that a little bit later. So what does the landscape look, look like now for gaming developers? We'll set the stage first. Everyone has different ambitions. Everyone has different goals. Everyone has different approaches. But we'll sort of take a, an archetype here and, and follow this example throughout the presentation. Our going in assumption is that an ambitious gaming developer wants to make more than just a beautiful game, an immersive game, a fun game. They want their work validated. They want to reach consumers. They need scale, and, they, and hopefully they can, they can validate their businesses by, by earning money. And we can argue about whether it should be the goal, but the top charts in the stores still today are the best proxies for who has reach, scale, and money. So one of the first questions that we look to answer with the data is who has success in today's landscape when we look at the stores? And we have three primary questions that we answer uh, around the top charts. Who gets in? Where do they land? So which positions do they land in? And how long do they stay? And we'll look at some of our data around this. Uh, for this, we're going to focus just on iOS just to keep the, the presentation clear. Uh, Slightly different profile on Google Play, um, but not too dissimilar, actually. Our data shows that 100 new games reach a top 200 position every day. What we're looking at here is the data for three separate countries, Germany, the United States, and Great Britain. And the bars, uh, the coloring of the bars breaks out between free and paid charts. If you look at the center of the screen, in the US, on a given day in the month of June, 25 new apps, games rather, earned a top 200 position. 60 new games earned a top 200 position uh, that were paid. It's really interesting, 60% that come in in ex-US markets actually are free to play games. And in the US, most of the newcomers are actually paid games. Um, this, is, this is data for the month of June. Once we see who makes it into the charts and keep that number of 100 kind of in your heads, we want to look at where they land. We all know that being higher in the charts means more visibility. There's massive exponential curves uh, and, and, and differences by being at place 1 or 2 versus place 100 or 101. Uh, and what we're showing here on this chart is the landing position for new games in the stores. Go all the way to the right of the chart. 5 and 6%, this is the amount of games that come in on a daily basis that reach a position greater than 20 or less than 20, so a top 20 position. The vast majority of games that come into the stores actually come in past rank 100, and we see a significant, significant drop off in terms of performance, quantifiable KPI performance, about how well games do when they get into those lower rank positions. And again, paid games here uh, are 1.7 times as likely, according to June data, to appear in a top 100 position versus games, uh, versus free games. So we've, we've answered the question, who gets in? We've answered the question, where do they land? The final question is, how long do they stay? And this is pretty striking data. 45% of new free games are out of the charts within a single day. They make it in, 
Everyone's celebrating back at headquarters. They're out the next day. And 95% of new games that come in are out within one week. Only 6% of new games that come into the stores last for more than two weeks. If you think about the time and effort which has gone into the development of the game, probably also the marketing expense, user acquisition expense for getting into the chart place in the first place, this is really striking data. It's one shot that you have, and for us, this is an unhealthy and unnatural system. And we'll talk about that in a little way, in a little bit. You really don't have a lot of staying power, and this has been quoted and, and referenced by plenty of people. If you're paying $2 an install and you have, you're out within a single day, how are you going to build a sustainable business on the back of that? It's really, really difficult. And we think it's uh, not a healthy scenario for, uh, for the stores. If we move from the top charts now to more quantifiable data, and this is what we estimate based on our own uh, data scientists and, uh, and a lot of the algorithms that we use to actually estimate uh, the performance, the download and revenue data, we see that the market is incredibly, incredibly concentrated. The top 300, coming back to 300, the top 300 publishers globally command 85% of all store downloads. The gray box at the top, 14%, 14% of the market is split between 475,000 developers. 300 take the remaining 85%. It is massively, massively concentrated. And we see the same thing, a little bit less pronounced on the revenue side, where the top 300 command 70% of store revenue. What kind of industry is this? And why, why is this okay? Why is this a sustainable, or how is this a sustainable model for such a transformational consumer media as mobile apps? So we don't think it's okay. We think that the implications of this data are really tragic for the industry. Game developers are key instigators of change, and they drive innovation. Game developers are publishing new apps and testing new categories more frequently than non-gaming. But if game developers fail too frequently, or if there are too few success stories, we think that that has really negative implications for the entire ecosystem, for the stores, for the consumers, for the developers, for the advertisers. It hits everybody, and we think that that's a problem. There are hundreds of quotes like this. We thought this was an interesting one from Michael. Um, you can skip to the last sentence. The question is, has the app gold rush finished, right? If UA is no longer viable, uh, if discoverability is really challenged, is this still a viable place for us? Is this still a viable channel for us? We think that something has to change uh, for the industry to become healthier and more sustainable for more developers. We're going to give an example about how we think, using some basic market data, which is freely available, um, developers can make better decisions about their investment. Um, and we're going to talk through that now. So we see two key root causes of some of the challenges that we, we've pointed out in this data. The first one is a cultural challenge. Creative, mobile gaming began as a creative industry. Creative genius may have been and still is in some cases enough for success. You hear about the Flappy Birds and maybe even the Crossy Roads where they're not necessarily predetermined winners, but they've had unbelievable success. Um, and business planning, goal setting, benchmarking, uh, we think that maybe initially that was a secondary uh, angle for many developers. And that's a cultural challenge. The second challenge we think is a market challenge, um, where even data-hungry developers, people who want access to benchmarking information, to market intelligence, they've been priced out of the market. Access to this data is gated by money right now in our industry. And most people who have the need can't satisfy it within their budgets. We think that this is tragic, particularly be because the only way that you can get access to market data, the only way that market data providers exist is by getting the information from publishers. The stores don't publicize it for plenty of good reasons, but if you are looking for a market data provider, 
that data is provided by you, the publishers, and they're turning it around and making it very difficult for you to access it at any point within your budget, and we think that that's a challenge. We think you can make smarter bets for free, and it's not by aiming for the top charts. So let's take an example here. Let's say you're gearing up for your next iOS game, and you've narrowed it down to two options. You're thinking about a billiards game, or you're thinking about a slots game. And you want to do some market data analysis to help sway your decision. You're about to put six months, nine months, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the development. Maybe you can do a little bit of work up front to understand which one of those might be a more viable option for you. So we think there are a couple key questions that you would want to answer. How big is the market? Is it growing or declining? Who's doing well? And can I compete against the leaders? Ultimately, is it worth your time, energy, and money? Let's define the market first. We've just done this as a basic example. You as developers will, will have a much better understanding of how these markets uh, fit together. What we've done is just taken the top 20 keyword results uh, within the store searches and use those results as the proxy for the billiards market or the slot market. Yeah, so that's the methodology that we've used. And with the first question, how large is the market? We'll look at it by downloads and then by revenue. In terms of downloads, year to date, uh, and this is Apple, App Store, year to date globally, uh, billiards games are 1.7 times larger than slots games. All the data is in millions here. So billiards games, 30 million downloads year to date. Slots games, 18 million downloads year to date. Yeah. When we flip over to revenue, however, it's a very different story. Slots games are 13 times larger than billiards games by revenue. Again, just looking at these categories, 20 billiards games, 20 slots games is a proxy for the whole market. Um, even comparing these two slides, you as a developer who's potentially looking to go in one direction or another, already have an impression of the different characteristics between those two gaming genres. If we go to the next question, how are the markets growing? Let's look at downloads. Slots downloads have been flat. Billiards downloads have been increasing. That might tell you, wow, okay, the billiards market may be, let's say, lower monetizing so far, but it seems to be growing. Maybe this is a topical phenomenon. Maybe this is some, maybe there's a seasonality associated with it. Maybe this is somewhere that we can actually uh, find a real opportunity. If we look over to revenue, Again, tale of sort of two cities and genres here. Billiards revenue has in fact been flat, while slots revenue has continued to increase. This tells you that slots revenue has been monetizing per download significantly better than billiards revenue in the year-to-date period. Question number three. I'll come to questions at the end. It's OK. Thanks. Uh, question number three, who's doing well in billiards? So looking at the data, the number one player in billiards commanded 84% of the downloads and 94% of revenue. This was 8-ball pool uh, by Miniclip. In the data set that we have, which is these 20 billiards apps and 20 slots apps, the market supported seven players in billiards who had more than 100K downloads a month. Only two players achieved more than 100K revenue per month. This market, by our definition, is, is very concentrated. If we flip over to slots, it's a very different picture. In slots, the number one player commanded 12% of the downloads. And actually, a different game had the top revenue spot, 34%. Double Down Casino and Heart of Vegas. 15 of the top 25 apps here achieved 100 download, more than 100K downloads a month. And 16 of the top 25 achieved more than 100K revenue a month. This market, by our definition, is more fragmented but does that mean that it's more of an opportunity for you? Does that mean it's a more attractive space for a new game? If you choose slots, you may have more of an overall market opportunity, but you're fighting for visibility against players who already earn millions of dollars a year. If you choose billiards, the overall market may be smaller or flatter, but could you make more of an impact? Which option should you choose? 
the answers to these questions are extremely specific to your situation. What's the confidence you have in your team, in your ability to build a fantastic game? Do you already have experience in one of these genres that you can leverage, that p potentially is differentiated versus the other models which are out there? What are your financial resources? And what are your financial targets? Your goal may be to earn 100,000, 200,000 a year, have a fantastic lifestyle business with your, with your game, and that's fantastic. That should be supported and embraced and that might be your benchmark for success. If you've had 10 million in venture funding and your investors are looking for a 10x outcome on, 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 their, on their money invested, it's a very different uh, set of goals that you may have and a different set of expectations that you have to fulfill. And we may not have hit all of the questions. This was a brief analysis that we went through and you as the publishers, as the developers, would know the specific questions to ask much better than we would. But I think we can agree that making a decision based on some of this, even high level data at this point, is better than just setting a strategy to say, I want to achieve a number 25 position in the store. So what's our role? The analysis that we just performed is directly accessible in our application. And that access is free to any publisher who partners with us. Partnering with us means sharing a data account and getting full access to our platform in return. For those without data to share, or for those who don't have or don't prefer to share the data, you can get access via subscription for $250 a month. We're making this available to more of the ecosystem because we think that it can play a role in having more success for more people. Over 650 top publishers are already working with us on this. Uh, we have some fantastic gaming names up here, like Two Dots, like Wargaming, Cherry Pick Games. We started this program nine months ago. It's grown exceptionally well for us, and we continue to see fantastic, fantastic traction with this. We think that there's a place for an app store intelligence platform for the 99%, more than just the top 300 players. We don't think that market data should be restricted to the top tier. We want to play a transformational role in breaking these barriers of exclusivity and the pay to play, which frankly have been around the market research business for way too long. It's a new area. We have big data. It's a sharing economy. We want to do something different. We think it's time for a new approach. And we're the company that wants to define it. You can learn more at our website, prioridata.com. You can apply to be a publisher partner, and you can be up and running with this data in five minutes. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Uh, hold on, we'll bring the mic over, then we can uh, record it for posterity. Hi there, I had a question about um, how you look at revenue, and it seems like everything that you presented in your slides deals with actual in-app revenue generated through the App Store. That's right, we're looking at in-store revenue, so this is a paid install or in-app purchase. We're not covering any advertising revenue. Do you have any plans to uh, generate data based on active usage of apps or things that would you know, show that there's a different value of a download based on, you know, whether somebody is a repeat user and this, their yeah. session lengths. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's a clear next step. It's something that actually our partners are already sharing with us. Uh, we haven't yet brought it into the platform, but it's, it's clearly something that's incredibly important and rounds out the story. Absolutely. Thanks. Yep. So you mentioned user acquisition costs earlier on, uh, mm -hmm. dollar eighty, dollar ninety, sort of two dollars, and you sort of hinted as though that may not be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Then you went on to say that the top three hundred people are making money. So it's kind of a brutal place out there. If you're a small indie studio, uh, can you make money by uh, paying those sort of same sort of costs, or the people at the top just sort of? mucking things up for everybody, saying, hey, they're just uh, carpet bombing everything, saying, we're, we're going to take it all out there. But they're still going to be making money, or are they not making money? They're just doing it to just spoil it for everybody else. So I won't comment on that last, uh, on that last piece, but we think, we think that there may be a smarter way for an indie developer, a smaller developer, to make a sustainable business 
without having to pay high user acquisition costs. We think that one of the ways that you can do that is being smarter on which markets you target, and that we think that you can actually benchmark and set expectations for your performance so that you don't necessarily have to pay those costs to achieve the outcomes that you want. So we would, I guess, generally guide against building the game, saving X percent of your entire budget for marketing, and throwing it for user acquisition in a single burst campaign because we don't see the results necessarily as sustainable. So if you're successful in the crystal ball, uh, is a user acquisition cost going to go down, remain the same, or are they going to get higher? You'll have to ask the advertising networks about that one. I, uh, I don't know. Um, I think probably over time the ability to target users in a better way according to demographic information or other profile information may actually bring uh, costs up for specific smaller segments uh, of user acquisition. What it does for the longer tail of advertising, I'm not, I don't know. Okay, so thank you very much for coming. I know we're, we're, we're kind of out of time. Are you here at the show? Where can people get hold of you yeah. as well as the address? Yeah, so um, let's see if I can't find the home button. Come find me, PrioriData.com. Patrick at PrioriData.com is my email address. I also have a colleague here, Andas, who's uh, be really happy to talk to you. We don't have a booth, but we're super friendly people, so we hope to get to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.